Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast covering documentary film. I'm Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival and artistic director of the Doc NYC Festival. This episode has two parts. In the first half, I talked to filmmaker Steve James about his career that began with hoop dreams. In the second half, I focus on his new film, Abacus, Small Enough to Jail, about a family-owned bank in New York's Chinatown. After the 2008 financial crisis, Manhattan DA Cyrus Vance Jr. singled out Abacus Bank for prosecution. But the bank's founder, Thomas Sun, fought back. Here's his wife in the film. Cyrus Vance just felt this is easier to attack, especially as a family bank. But he doesn't realize Tom is not easy to be pushed around. And my girls, they're tough, smart, capable women, so courageous. Later in the program, I interview three of Thomas Sun's daughters, Jill, Vera, and Chanterelle. They describe their experiences undergoing a long trial and having it filmed. We begin with director Steve James. He grew up in Virginia, where he played high school basketball. As an undergraduate at James Madison University, he became interested in film. His girlfriend, Judy, who later became his wife, was headed to graduate school at Southern Illinois University, so he enrolled in a film program. There, he was exposed to documentaries such as Barbara Koppel's Harlan County, USA, and Michael Apted's 28 Up. They inspired him to embark on his first film, Hoop Dreams. The film follows two high school basketball players over four years as they nurture hopes for the NBA. The dreams belong not only to the players, but also to their families seeking a way out of poverty. One of the film's main subjects is named Arthur Agee. Here he is near the start of the film at age 14. I'm not getting the NBA. I'm a, uh, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go see my mama. I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to go down and make sure my sister and my brother's okay. And if we can, I'm going to probably get my dad Cadillac Oldsmobile so he can cruise in the game. I sat down with Steve James in front of a small audience at the Montclair Film Festival in early May. After his graduate school at Southern Illinois University, he and Judy moved to Chicago. He got the idea for a documentary while playing basketball in a gym. But it was different from what Hoop Dreams became. I was trying to be practical. Um, uh, I'd, we had just moved to Chicago. Um, the initial idea was to actually just focus on a single playground because what I had noticed in the gym there that day was a kind of camaraderie and stuff from pickup ball, right? Because that's what was going on there. And I thought, you know, it'd be great to kind of delve deeply into a single playground in Chicago and, and sort of understand the code and culture of the game. And, uh, and on that court, there might, might, you know, hopefully be young aspiring players like Arthur and William proved to be and older players who had come through the system and it hadn't worked out for them, like, William's brother ended up sort of playing that role. And I was hoping I might pick a court, we might pick a court where a professional player in the NBA came from. So there was always that, that dream of like, I want to be him. Uh, and that was a perfectly good idea. And in fact, some years later, not too long after Hoop Dreams came out, there was a film which you've probably seen called Soul to the Hole. Have you seen that film? Yeah, you know, the funny thing about Soul to the Hole is I remember when I first moved to New York in 1994, a friend of mine had, was an associate producer on that film. They were still finishing it, and they were all kind of nervous and irritated because they heard about this film called Hoop Dreams that was going to be <laughs> coming to the Sundance Film Festival before they had finished their film. Oh, sorry to hear that. Um, I didn't know that. So you uh, start out with this idea, like you'll make right. it about a, a exactly. playground. And, 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 then, and then we, we tried to get funding and failed miserably. Um, and then I finally uh, was able to secure a $2,000 grant from the Illinois Arts Council, which is like NEA money at the state level. And, uh, and it was, in fact, that professor of mine who was on the panel that year, and I'm pretty sure he 
you know, made sure we got the money. It was the only money we got for three and a half years. And so we said, okay, we got to go out and do something. We got to just start shooting something. And so we did. And we went out looking for the playground. And that's when, if you've seen Hoop Dreams or if you've seen it and remember, at the beginning of the film, we are going around with this scout, this named Earl Smith, a street sort of agent scout kind of guy. And he, he was showing us playgrounds. And that's where he discovers Arthur. He sees this kid and he's like, this, this kid's got some talent. I will bet you a steak dinner in four years you'll be hearing from him. I don't even know anything about him. And we just said, okay, well, we just started shooting. And, and then it kind of morphed. It morphed immediately away from the initial idea, which was he was going to recruit this kid out to a high school powerhouse program. And that was really fascinating. And so we just, for that first week or so, we kind of followed it. And when we went out there, when Arthur goes out to play at the camp and he ends up playing against his hero, Isaiah Thomas, that's when we met William through the coach. And it's not like we immediately said, oh, we're going to follow them for the next four years. But I do remember in that initial, there's an initial meeting. It's in the film where Arthur's family meets with the coach, Coach Pingator. And Pingator says, well, if you come to this school and you take care of the books and you work hard at basketball. In four years, I'll help you go to college. And I and I remember we thought, well, what an extraordinary promise to make to someone you literally just met, and who's a very rough talent. He's not like, you know, he wasn't like, oh my God, you know, Earl saw something in him that we I didn't see, and so I just remember we thought like, wow, that's extraordinary. And then it wasn't. It just gradually kind of dawned on us that, well, maybe we could followed them like come in check in with them once a month or something you know we didn't know we didn't have any money so we didn't know what we'd do but it it gradually morphed into this obsessive four year you know four and a half year craziness and uh i'm curious about the the team of people who you built up around uh hoop dreams yes. uh one of them was uh camera person peter gilbert who yes. had previously worked with Barbara Koppel, uh, uh, who you'd been so impressed by. Yeah, so Peter, so first it started with me and Frederick Marx, who was a, um, a friend from uh, grad school. And, um, and, and, <clears throat> and Fred had played high school basketball. Uh, and so I told him about the idea, and um, he liked it and, and wanted to be involved. And so we kind of partnered up with it, we came to sh we uh, came to Chicago. We pitched it to Cartemquin Films, um, and uh, they took us under their wing, even though we had no money because they liked it. Again, we were pitching the short at that point, <laughs> um, and, and but we needed a camera person, and because we had no money, and and back then you have to understand it's very different than now. It's like. We'd are at the point in time where we decided like we're going to give up on, you know, I was studied film, Fred studied film, and it was like giving up on trying to make this as a film because of the expense. We're going to shoot video, and this is at a time when video was just really starting to make inroads into into documentary filmmaking, and uh, and, and maybe so just to break down that decision, if you're shooting on sixty millimeter film, like ten minutes of film that you shoot cost you about three hundred, four hundred dollars once you factor in all the processing fees. Yeah. Whereas shooting sixty minutes of video cost you at that time, I don't know, the price of a tape would be ten bucks for a tape or something. And yeah, so yes, yeah, so if we were shooting film, that two thousand dollars wouldn't go very far, would it? We <laughs> it would have been a short. Um so we realized when we were about to get underway, like, okay, we're going to have to just shoot video, at least for now, and, and it's going to be a short. And we're, so, but we at least want it to be the best-looking video possible, broadcast quality video. And what you have to understand is at that time in the mid-'80s, um, a quality broadcast camera, very few people owned them outside of TV stations because they were about sixty to $80,000. I mean, and... The quality of what they would get you in today's terms is, you know, you would never use that camera today. Um, so you had to know someone, and we, in our case, had to we had to find someone. And through Cartemquin, they hooked us up with Peter because Peter was involved with Cartemquin, and they told me, you know, um, you know, he shot for Barbara Koppel on American Dream, another great 
uh, film from Barbara Koppel. And I was like, wow. And she and Marcy McCall, who worked at Kartemko, who suggested him, said, and he's a huge basketball fan. <laughs> so I called Peter up, and literally the first conversation I had with Peter, we talked for like three hours on the phone, and we just talked basketball for three hours. And he was willing to kind of jump in. He was a partner in a camera with another shooter. And... And then he came on board and was willing to kind of do it for nothing, and you know, which was extraordinary. And and then eventually, Peter became uh, not just uh, the camera person on the film; he became a full-on producer of the film with me and and Frederick. In Hoop Dreams, we see Chicago as a tale of two cities. There are poor black neighborhoods where talents like Arthur Agee are scouted. Then. There's the elite prep school of St. Joseph's that recruits those players for its basketball program. In this clip, we hear from St. Joseph's white coach Pinatori and Arthur Agee. When Arthur first started at St. Joseph's, he was a good kid from what we saw, but he was very mature. He might have been a little more disruptive, speaking out, getting into childish things. He wasn't used to the discipline and the control. He reverted back to maybe his environment, where he came from. I just never been around a lot of white people, and uh, it was different because at a black school, you know, I could associate with the people that was, you know, you know, they talk the way I talk. It's a little hard, but I, I can adjust to it. You can see there was talent there. We kept saying up in the stands, Get the ball to Arthur because he's going to do it for you. And sure enough, they gave him the ball with seconds on the clock. Steve describes how Hoop Dreams evolved to become the breakthrough we know today. All the time we were doing this, we, we didn't know what would become of this film because um, we did eventually get public television money. So we knew it, would, it was going to be on public television. But it, it, it kind of mushroomed. At first it was going to be an hour long, then it was going to be 90 minutes, then it was going to be two hours, and then eventually it was going to be three hours. And by the time we got to three hours, it was like, well, we're pretty much going to be on at 11 p.m. at night um, on public television stations because, you know, it's like this one-off whatever film. But we actually, when it, when it got into Sundance, that that was the the game changer um, because Sundance wasn't it was still it was it was big then but it wasn't as big as it is now but it was still the kind of like you know independent and for documentaries it was a it was a very important um, get as it were for the film so um, because of Sundance and because Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel um, decided to review the film while it was at Sundance on their show, which was hugely popular. It just was like, you know, it made a huge difference for the film um, and led to theatrical distribution. It was something I never thought was possible. After Hoop Dreams, doors opened for Steve to direct fiction films. The first was called Prefontaine, starring Jared Leto, based on the true story of the track star who died at age 24. Steve went on to direct two more sports-related fiction films for television. So yeah, because of Hoop Dream's success, um, you know, I had a bit of that. Um, if you've seen the film The Big Picture with um, Kevin Bacon, um, it's a Christopher Guest movie. It's very funny. It's about a guy, guy grad school, makes a movie and becomes a hot commodity in L.A. And it's very funny kind of had that moment there for a while. I had a lot of meetings in L.A., and it led to um, me uh, and Peter, me directing and Peter producing and shooting um, this film, Prefontaine, which, and they even let me write, rewrite the script, which, they were, like, I had no screenwriting credits, but it was like they were willing to let You're me. You're the guy who made Hoop Dreams. I'm the guy who made Hoop Dreams, so I, clearly I know a lot about running. So... Uh, <laughs> So, you know, it was just, I mean... and so that I'm, I'm very interested in this because I think a lot of documentary filmmakers go through this if they are fortunate enough to get some uh, yeah. attention as documentary filmmakers. Uh, you know, a lot of them harbor um, hopes to, to make a, a fiction film. And, right. And very rarely has that been a successful transition. 
Yeah, I'm one of the few in which it was a huge success, I think. Uh, um, no, it wasn't. I was not a huge success. So, yeah, I, well, and I started out loving movies. So it was kind of like, oh, wow, this, I, I, you know, and if I'd been, if I'd known, I would have had a script ready to go or something, but I didn't because Hoop Dreams was so surprising and what happened to it. So, um, you know, it, it was a, and of course, I ended up making a pseudo documentary um, with Prefontaine, um, which, you know, had its charms. It didn't quite work as well as one would want, but, um, but you know, I got this opportunity to do it, and then I got an opportunity to make a couple other cable movies, the ones you mentioned. And each time I did them, I felt like I got better at it. Um, in, in each one of them, somewhere in the middle of each one of them, I swore I'd never do it again. Um, because it's just, it is such a different kind of filmmaking. Uh, you know, the, the, the easy, um, you know, way to refer to it is, is that in, in documentary film, you're trying to capture lightning in a bottle. And in fiction film, you're trying to create lightning in a bottle. And I just found it to be a, a very hard transition um, in part because the, the, the thing that makes documentary filmmaking so wonderful for me as an experience is the intimacy of it and the, the fact that you don't have a script, that you, you go into a situation and then you just you follow it where it leads you and you follow your subjects where they lead you and the story where it leads you. And it's, you're constantly reinventing what it is you're making and, and then you reinvent it again when you get to the editing, right? And in fiction filmmaking, there are filmmakers who work in that vein, but they're few and far between. You know, you're mostly you need to come up with a script that works, and then make a film and tr translate that into a film that works. And it's a much, much more codified. And it's a and and the films that I was doing, there were big crews on them, not like Star Wars level, you know, not blockbuster level crews, but there's big crews. So it's like it's like a military campaign you know, um, instead of a kind of intimate, creative process, at least in my experience. Uh, again and again in your films, uh, race is a big factor. Hoop Dreams, The Interrupters, uh, uh, your new film, Abacus. Um, and I wonder um, why you think you're uh, continually drawn back to that as a, as a subtext. I thought you were going to say, I wonder why you think you should be making such films about race. Well, you could answer that one, too. <laughs> um, I think I'm drawn back to it in part because of my upbringing. Uh, I grew up in Hampton, Virginia. Um, there's a film that I did for the ESPN series called uh, No Crossover, The Trial of Alan Iverson, where I actually detail some of this um, because I go back to my hometown to try and understand why Alan Iverson life was turned upside down as a result of a bowling alley brawl when he was in high school and we're from the same hometown I, and I really delve into race in the community but um, you know my ex my life growing up because of uh, I grew up in a in in a community that was that was very much black and white um, I went to a high school you know in which um, as a member of the basketball team um, when we had a pep rally um, uh, the school was about, 55% white, 45% black. And, and how I know that is because when we go to the gym for the pep rally, all the white students would sit on one side of the stands and all the black students would sit on the other side. And then there was a thin sliver of white students that didn't get into the, you know, the white side. That, and when they would introduce black players, the black side would cheer. And when they'd introduce white players, the white side would cheer. And then and it was like this kind of competition to see who could cheer the loudest. And I remember at the time thinking that was kind of funny, not really getting the seriousness of it. But as it went on, and and I worked for my dad in the summers, and he had a black employee, his, he had a carpeting and floor tile business, and I was Alan's helper. Race just started to kind of become something I thought about, even as a very young person, um, because it was sort of in my face so much. And and I think that fascination grew there, started there, and and... Um, and then grew from there. And so when I got around to making uh, films, starting with Hoop Dreams, Hoop Dreams resonated for me on a number of levels. It resonated with me as an ex-basketball player who had his own dreams and aspirations, but it also resonated. And I really didn't discover this until later, Tom, 
when I made No Crossover, which was made in like 2009, 10, I, it was when I made that film, I realized one of the reasons why I wanted to make Hoop Dreams, which was, is that I was looking to try to understand something about my black teammates that, that had only just been teammates, never friends, really, you know. And so, um, I don't know, the fascination began there, and America is so much defined by race uh, historically and right up to today that there, you're never want for ways to explore it. This business that you're in is not an easy business. Uh, you've uh, raised a family uh, while doing it. Um, how have you made it work for you, and, and have there been times when you were ready to walk away and try something else? I was... Um I was never ready to walk away and try something else. There, there were struggles. You know, after Hoop Dreams, I, um, f fortunately, the Hollywood thing happened because the next documentary I made, Stevie, was a film that no one wanted to give money to. And in fact, we had to fund it ourselves for a while until finally we got a little bit of money. Um, it was not, you know, it was a film about a kid that I was a big brother to when I lived in Southern Illinois going to grad school who is charged with molesting an uh, eight-year-old uh, cousin. Um, and so anyway, you know, you can see why people might not want to fund that. But, um, but over the years, um, first of all, the Hollywood stuff made a difference because it actually, we had no, a, not a nickel to our name when we finished Hoop Dreams, me and my wife. Um, and that actually helped to, you know, stabilize us. <laughs> um, and... And, and so, but over the years, what I have, um, you know, I did that for a while and that helped. But then, uh, you know, I haven't done that for a while, a good long while. And I've just been doing documentaries. But in and around that, I've had the good fortune to occasionally do some branded kind of content webisode stuff, you know, that, that pays a lot better than making documentaries. Um, and that has seemed to come along at the right time. Um, you know, it's, this process drove my wife crazy those for a lot of years because the, the idea of me not having a regular job just drove her nuts because we, it was, you know, I was a total freelancer and she, she, she finally learned to roll with the punches and it's, it's worked out. But, but it, you know, when I started Hoop Dreams, we didn't have a child. By the end of Hoop Dreams, we had three kids. So it was very productive <laughs> time. I asked Steve how he practices the art of observation, filming people as if the camera wasn't there. I have found over the years, even as I have gotten older and grayer, um, that the key to uh, gaining access um, is candor and, and finding people who, um, who want to be in the film for the right reasons. Yes, there's a little bit of fame that comes with being in a documentary, even, you know, it, it may be more or less depending on how well your film does. And there's a flattery to that by saying to people, like, I want to follow your story. It's like that that can be flattering and appealing. But that is not enough to sustain someone to be in your film. They need to want to be in it for the right reasons. And I think they need to understand your reasons for wanting to make it. And I think it's really key to, to approach the stories from a standpoint of, I know nothing. And I'm here to understand, I'm here to learn, I, I am here to try to channel you, not me. I, I look at them very much as collaborative. I look at them as I'm making a film with you, not on you. Um, and, and if you succeed in getting to that place with your subjects, then that's where, you know, the, 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 it it's, seems like a little bit of a paradox on the face of it, but if you think about it, it's not at all. It's like the more, uh, the more your subjects feel a sense of control of what you're, they're involved with with you, the more willing they are get, to give up that control to you because they trust you. And, um, and I think that's a, that's a real key to this kind of filmmaking. And I think also uh, two other th quick things. One is um, uh, they need to enjoy the process. They need to enjoy being around you. Um, if you're, I, I think this, I think the, the, this is a reason why um, there aren't a lot of really asshole documentary filmmakers. Um, you know, you have to go to the fiction side to find a lot of them. Um, because in the fiction side, you can be a total asshole and people think it's creative and like, oh, you're, you know, he's a real, oh, you know, he's an artist, you know, just, you know. 
But in the documentary world, your subjects won't want to spend time with you if you're an asshole, and they'll find reasons not to. And I work with people who are good people, person. We have a lot of fun. I mean, I try to make it fun, even if it's serious. And we had more laughs on the interrupters because the people I was with are funny, and we we just enjoyed each other's company. And that even I though it's at a Against a backdrop of, of, of urban violence. Yeah, there were plenty of days where it wasn't funny at all. But the, but there but our interactions with each other were were very human and and we enjoyed each other's company. And I think that's that's a real important thing. We'll be back to discuss Steve James's new film, Abacus: Small Enough to Jail, with the three Chinese American sisters who are subjects in the film: Jill, Vera, and Chanterelle Sun. That's coming up after the break. Pure Nonfiction will be taking off for summer after episode 50 and returning in the fall. But during our hiatus, you can still enjoy our past interviews. Last September, I spoke with Steve James just before the TIFF world premiere of Abacus. He talked to me via Skype, describing what's at stake for the Sun family in the film. If they are found guilty, um, they run a very serious risk of the bank going out of business. And not only uh, if the bank goes out of business, is that you know bad for them as a family, because it's their enterprise, their livelihood. It's, you know, it's, it's bad for the community uh, of Chinatown community, of which they have been such an integral part all these years. And then, you know, what's also at stake is, um, their sense of of right and wrong for themselves and pride, um, as as uh, Mrs. Sung says at one point, talks about the loss of face um, uh, if they're found guilty. So it's it's you know it's deeply important for them on so many levels. And then from our point of view, there are also these even greater stakes about questions about justice in America and about um, who you know, who gets justice in America and, and who goes on trial in America. And that takes us back to the, the kind of larger questions about the big banks versus a small community bank in Chinatown. You can hear that interview with Steve James on episode 19. You'll find it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. For more information, visit purenonfiction.net. Abacus Small Enough to Jail tells the story of the banker Thomas Sun and his family as they fight to clear their name against an aggressive prosecution. The story begins in 2012, when Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance Jr. held a press conference. Today, we are announcing the indictment of 19 individuals on charges including mortgage fraud, securities fraud, and conspiracy as well as the indictment of Abacus Federal Savings Bank, a federally chartered bank that has been catering to the Chinese immigrant community since 1984. If we have learned anything from the recent mortgage crisis, it's that at some point these schemes unravel and taxpayers can be left holding the bag. While the banks that were too big to fail got bailouts, Abacus was small enough to jail. Asian employees of the bank were arrested and paraded in a chain gang before TV cameras. After the highly publicized arrest, the story was scarcely covered outside the Chinese-American press, but the Sun family were adamant in defending themselves. Their lawyer, Kevin Pawlowski, describes the odds. They made a decision that they were not going to plead guilty to something that they didn't feel the bank was guilty of. That is a courageous choice, uh, and it's an expensive choice. The DA's office has hundreds of lawyers and took five years to do their grand jury investigations, and it, it is a daunting task to fight the government. If you haven't seen the film, I won't tell you how it turns out. But one of its pleasures is to spend time with the Sun family. Thomas has four daughters, smart, witty, cosmopolitan New Yorkers. Two of them, Jill and Vera, hold key positions at the bank. The youngest, Chanterelle, is a lawyer. In the film, we witness their interactions during the trial, often in Chinatown restaurants. The family banter has an unexpected comedy. Here's a scene where the daughters discuss the trial with their father. Chanterelle sets it up. 
I get really frustrated sometimes. This is probably a factor of being the youngest, but sometimes I just, like, whatever I say, it's just not heard. Papa, if that's you are the, not convincing. If that's, the form, if that's the form that you choose to use, I'll tell you what use, is tongue-in-cheek. She said no harm, no foul. If that's the form... I never said that. Hold on, she I have a question, that. Papa. I didn't say that. If that's the form that you choose she to use used to represent... If that is she the form... That, that's, not, that's not true. I, I, I just told I'm you, there that. is harm. It's very difficult. Okay, to nothing parcel, more for me to say. This. A week ago at New York's IFC Center, I hosted three of the Sun Sisters for a conversation after a screening of Abacus. I asked Vera how they decided to let a film crew cover their story. So um, I knew the one of the producers, Mark Mitten, uh, for quite some time, way before even this trial, and I, you know, like any friend of mine, while I was going through this experience, I was sharing with them the story. Um, and I remembered at the beginning of the trial, Mark Mitten said to me, um, you do realize that you are probably the only bank that has been indicted in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. And I said, oh, yeah, 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 but we're all preparing for trial right now, w whatever. Um, so then the next thing is, um, he actually said, I think a documentary should be made of this. Um, and then I remember he brought in um, Steve James, a director he had worked with on another movie before called Life Itself. And um, he came in and brought Steve James and, and um, Steve James interviewed us. I asked Jill if they took time to research Steve James. Um, I knew Steve James already because when I was in college, I saw Hoop Dreams and it was a really, I always tell everybody, I was not into documentaries at all until I saw that one. And that was a very important point in my life and documentary understanding, appreciation. So I was quite awed and my husband, who's not involved in this film at all and who's not a film person at all, had also seen Hoop Dreams with me. And so he was very awed as well. And he was very impressed. He was like, oh, Steve James, you know, and he made a point to go up to say hello to him. So yes, he was very, he was definitely someone very, someone that we were very happy to work with. Chantrell, what was your biggest concern about having a film camera capturing this? <laughs> Probably my biggest concern, other than being camera shy, um, was just the task at hand. And obviously, you know, going to trial was a huge thing. Um, we had to focus on that. And every minute, every second, we had to, you know, make sure that we were bringing the best defense that we could. Um, and, you know, a large part of going to trial, you obviously you have to be credible um, to the jury, to the judge, um, and that, I think for me, I was afraid that if we were being filmed, and this didn't end up happening, but there was, you know, at one point- You'd be like the real housewives of Chinatown. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the cameras weren't allowed ultimately in the courtroom, but that was one concern, you know, just remaining focused on actually defending ourselves and, and the trial, so, um, but that quickly, as I have said before, I, so I wasn't, as well informed um, and hadn't seen Hoop Dreams, although I'd heard of it. Um, That's to say you're younger. <laughs> yeah, we can blame it on that. <laughs> but um, I, when Steve sat down with me, um, it was it was just actually incredible because it was the first time that um, that I think any of us had really spoken to sort of an outside party about what we were going through. You know, we had good friends and family that we were speaking to about this. Um, and so when he, Steve interviewed me, I just felt like he, he was just such a down to earth, nice and understanding person that I completely opened up, contrary to how I thought I might be during the interview and being on camera and just started everything, emotions flowing. And <laughs> so that's what happened. That's probably why you saw me crying on the screen. Chanterelle's position in this case was especially difficult. At the time of the abacus indictment, she was working for the Manhattan DA as a prosecutor. In the film, she remembers the day the bank's employees were paraded as a Chang gang. I got off the elevator and I saw what was happening. I had never seen that in my entire time at the DA's office. I mean, this was like the case of the century. She eventually left the DA's office to work with her family. I asked her how she faced that dilemma. So I had, at that point, already been working at the office for um, almost six years. Um, it was the last year and a half of my time there that this happened. And for me, it was, it was very surreal because I had had such a great experience there, and I still have lifelong friends from the district attorney's office, including 
my supervisors and, and managers who I respect tremendously. So when this happened, um, it was very hard to really comprehend um, because I had felt that everything that I had learned there and in terms of you know ethics and justice um, just weren't happening. Uh, and so that the very first thing that I had to do was um, go to my supervisor and tell him that this was happening, which was hard in itself. Uh, and then he explained, well, you know, don't worry, sometimes things like this happen. Um, although I don't think he, he knew exactly the extent of it, but he explained that there was another um, one of the executive assistants who I would then have to speak to due to the conflict of interest, and it would just have to be sort of, um, you know, reported, so to speak, and then I could continue with my duties in the office. But it, it really left me feeling conflicted even though I still knew that I had friends there and that I had learned what I you know really valued there um, so it was like two being in two worlds literally here's Vera and then um, we also um, knew that Chantrell was working there so when this investigation happened we were we made it um, we tried very hard not to talk to her or share with her anything that was going that, w that we were going through as we did not want to affect her job um, at the office right, or that, impact that was, her. Yeah, and so I was told that I couldn't, it, it was, I was told the way I was told, it, um, they didn't want, the people in my office had told me not to try to find out what was going on with the case because then I may be compelled to act upon it and that is when the conflict would arise. So, the, so I was told to just really not know what was going on and that was especially difficult because this was my family um and so it one of the reasons why i left ultimately was because then i felt like i could be free then to know everything that i wanted to know um and then actually be able to help my family jill having gone through this after the trial was over do you did you feel like okay now i want to go back to work and put this behind me or is there a way having gone through this that it's changed you. Um, that's a, <laughs> so the answer is yes to both. That you know there is the natural, I think, human need to try to move on um, when something pretty traumatic happens, and and you and you feel part of the healing process to be able to st say that's part of your past, and I need to move forward. But you can also see it as a, as a foundation or a springboard for us to move forward in a better way. And so that's how I look at it um, when I go to work. Um, you know, I, I appreciate a lot more of what I have and what I'm doing. Um, and the, you know, we always felt that the indictment and the trial was an attack on our values and what the bank stood for and the mission of the bank. But, be, you know, it, we always thought that there was a grave miscalculation on the part of the DA's office because what it did it was strengthen our belief in our community and our mission and our values. Um, and so that that's what happens is that you become more embedded and more strong in what you believe and more much more sense of conviction of what you want, what you're doing. In the audience was the esteemed civil rights attorney, Norman Siegel, who stood up to make a comment. His voice wasn't captured by the microphone, but it was filled with emotion. He commended the sisters for their bravery in telling their story and said, it's important for the public to see what the system is about and what prosecutorial abuse is all about. He added, as far as I'm concerned, the Sun family is a terrific American family. Then he asked the sisters what they think is the film's message. Chanterelle was choked up but took the lead in answering. So there's so much. Um, I think <clears throat> one is we all have a sense of idealism, um, you know, coming from, I don't, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting emotional now, but that was really nice words. Um, <laughs> so maybe you should go first. But no, I was just going to say that our parents, being immigrants, um, have always believed in, I think, you know, the American dream and the system. And then something like this happens and you walk away feeling like, like literally, and I keep saying this, but no good deed goes unpunished. So then what's left is you become a little cynical 
um, and less ideal, but I think it's very important not to let that cynicism um, get in the way of you trying to improve and continue to try to contribute to the public good. And I think that this experience has empowered us as a family even more to do that. Um, it's very easy to kind of sit back and sort of give up. <clears throat> but with the sort of momentum that's come from this film and the word getting out there and just, sorry, <laughs> hearing <laughs> hearing this feedback um, from the public, it's encouraging to know that we still have work left to be done. And it's important. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Vera. And Norman, all your life, I know you've at, you know been a strong advocate for people's rights, and you have seen throughout your entire career how um, it is so easy for innocent people to be prosecuted, accused, and then found guilty or pleading guilty to crimes they've never committed before. Ninety-seven percent of all um, in, I've heard all felony cases, um, federal cases, 97% of people who've been indicted, and you can indict a ham sandwich, 97% um, plead guilty. So that's a lot of people who do not have the wherewithal, the um, um, an ability to push through and go to trial and to be able to um, be exonerated. Um, so I think we need to look at why this happens and um, and how it happened in our case and we have to systematically think where we can improve and prevent things along the way um, so that this does not happen again. Um, while this was happening, I kept on thinking to myself, I, I know that I'm actually in a much better position because I am able to afford justice and a lot of people have, you know, are not able to afford justice. There are many people who are, um, you know, who are, uh, who are innocent, who have been, who are on death row, who even, you know, have been, um, who have, you know, been um, put to death because of crimes they've never committed before. So I'm not sure that answers your question, but it's a discussion that has to be thought out and, and, and we have to think what we need to do. Um, for me, I think that, I mean, all the things that my sister said on, on stage and, and t in what you said just a minute ago, I agree absolutely with. Um, one of the important lessons I think I've learned is the importance of s sticking together when you, with, with your community, with your family, and with your friends. And I keep on saying this, this whatever happened, you saw, this would not have happened without more than one person supporting us, um, helping us, us as a family together and I think that calls for in a more specific way organization in order for us to do all the things that we are talking about that need to be done you we have to be organized and we have to um, work together um, and you know that to me was the most important point that I, I, I that I stick to and I listen to and I believe to you have to work with your the people with your community with your family with your friends to get these things that are wrong that have to be right I want to thank Steve James, as well as Jill, Vera, and Chanterelle Sun for speaking with me. The film Abacus Small Enough to Jail is being released in theaters this spring. Steve James was recorded at the Montclair Film Festival by Aaron Hodgins Davis. The Sun Sisters were recorded by Joseph Schroeder as part of the Stranger Than Fiction series at the IFC Center. Thanks to our team, series producer Michael Scotty Jr., Sound mixer, Kyle Murphy. Web designer, Cross Strategy. Marketing coordinator, Sarah Modo. Social media master, Jordan Smith. And executive producer, Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at THOM Powers. If you're in New York, come see our series, Stranger Than Fiction, on Tuesday nights at the IFC Center. The spring season runs through June 6th. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net.